about three years now. And um, initially our project was about um, documenting, mapping, and trying to understand the relationship between art and the communities where it exists. And um, a year and a half ago with the rise of COVID and uh, mo most importantly, the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis here in the Twin Cities, um, we shifted our work to uh, documenting and archiving art specifically that had to do with those two crises. And today we're going to talk about art that um, is, has been associated with the um, movement for uh, racial justice that has followed uh, the murder of George Floyd here in the Twin Cities, and that has uh, really moved around the world and become a global movement. Um, why street art? We think that street art is really important because it can um, reveal immediate responses to world events in a manner that can be raw, direct, and revealing. Um, these visual expressions can help to make externally visible what people think, believe, or feel both individually and in groups in the context of crisis, we argue that street art has the potential to reach a wide global audience, transform and activate public space and foster a sustained critical dialogue. Um, and we also wanted to, in our work, broaden the understanding of what art actually is um, to go beyond, you know, just thinking about murals and the sort of most beautiful and bright and uh, let's say aesthetically appealing um, pieces and to include um, everything, a sort of large, large um, range of, of what we call street art, um, which we do, we include in that category, um, graffiti, stickers, wheat paste, light projections, um, anything that is painted, drawn on, projected, or affixed to permanent structures in the built environment. And you've just, if you were on with us for the last half hour, you've seen a really great slideshow, um, a selection of art from the um, George Floyd and anti-racist street art database. Um, that was about 60 pieces in that slideshow. This, the, the database now has over 2,000 pieces in it, and that, that is open and accessible for anyone. And you saw the URL on the slideshow. Um, I think imp most important for today, in our work, we have tried to partner with community organizations, and um, we really want to try in our work to center and highlight the um, work of uh, BIPOC artists in the community, in our community especially. Um, and we you know, see a lot of ways in which the, those folks have been marginalized. And so our, our work is an attempt to um, help to amplify those voices, the, the work and their voices if we can. So today is a, a further opportunity to do that. I just wanna say before I turn it over to my colleagues to introduce the panelists, um, that there are a couple of things um, First of all, so I don't know, I hope, I, I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar with Zoom, but basically we're gonna have a conversation and then there'll be a time for a question and answer at the end for the audience. If you have questions and you want to pose your questions, you can do it uh, one of two ways. So you can either um, use the raise hand feature, um, which is at the bottom of your um, screen. And if you use that raise hand feature, it will move you to the top of the, of the screen so we can see who has a question. It'll be easier for us to see if someone has that question. We'll call on you, you can unmute and then ask your question, or you can put your question in the chat at any point during uh, today's uh, program. So if you have a question, when someone's talking about something, you have an immediate question at that point, just put it in the chat and then we will go and we'll we'll get those out and bring those to uh, pose to our uh, panelists at the end of the session. Um, I think that's all I have to say about the about the uh, the upcoming um, conversation. I'm really excited, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Heather Shirey to introduce the panelists. Thanks so much, Todd. We're really glad to be here today, and this will just be very brief. I just want to introduce our our research partners who are helping to moderate the panel and they will introduce the artist. So I just wanna say thanks so much to Labor Fest for making this conversation possible today. We're really glad to be able to, to get together and have what we hope will be a really casual conversation. And we hope that you'll have questions uh, for the artists as well. Uh, and also I just wanna thank uh, our student researchers who have done all the work to make this possible. So I'll introduce them. We have on this call, Amber Delgado, who's a master's student in the program of Heritage Studies and Public History at the University of Minnesota. And we have uh, Frederica Simmons, who's a Master of Arts student in Art History and Museum Yay. Studies at the University of St. Thomas. And Rachel Weyer, who's also a student in the Master of Arts program in Art History and Museum Studies 
at St. Thomas. And then not with us right yet, but perhaps joining us in a bit is Adam Majulu, who's also helped facilitate uh, things today. Also a student in the Master of Arts program and the Museum Studies Certificate program. So I will hand things over to them to facilitate this conversation. And once again, thanks for making this possible. And thanks to our artists for joining us today. Thank you, Heather, for that introduction. Um, I'll just give us all a little context before Amber goes into introducing the artists, and then we'll get this conversation started. So the uprisings of the summer of 2020 have often been referred to as a breaking point for the country as a whole, particularly for the city of Minneapolis. There was and continues to be a breaking open and unearthing of how deeply embedded and concealed racism thrives in the Midwest, and with that, a reckoning in progress. In order to begin conversations about the artwork created in response to the uprising, our goal with this discussion today is to think more deeply about what entirely goes into the process of creating during this moment. Minneapolis has prided itself on being immensely rich in resources, and in the summer of 2020, efforts to support and ensure Black, Indigenous, and other artists of color were included in these opportunities was prioritized. What accounts for this historic imbalance in the Twin Cities art scene? What does it mean to produce public murals about communal pain while also trying to care for oneself? What are the lasting changes that must be implemented to support BIPOC artists in the future? Our panel seeks to answer these questions and more with two Minneapolis-based BIPOC artists and muralists as they share in conversation their experiences of creating work during a physically and emotionally demanding summer. And to clarify for everyone, when we say BIPOC, that is an, um, an acronym for Black Indigenous People of Color. And now Amber will introduce everyone else. Thank you, Patricia. So um, for today's panel, we're joined by two artists who will more so be in discussion with each other, answering some guided questions we've prepared for today's event. Uh, the artists in conversation today are Maya Leah Hartman and Simone Alexa. And I'm just gonna briefly read their bios. Uh, Maya Leah Hartman is a muralist and mixed media artist living and working in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Being a self-taught artist, their work has largely been informed by generational influences. They look at their environment and interactions as the teachers who inform their work. Maya was one of nine artists in the initial Studio 400 cohort, a program for emerging artists led by Leslie Barlow and Public Functionary. Maya currently holds studio space in public functionary studio number 285 in the North of King building. In the past year, they have worked on a number of murals with Creatives After Curfew, a group that was born in response to the uprising with a goal of envisioning a future rooted in justice and liberation. Maya is a current artist in residence with the Minnesota African American Heritage Museum and Gallery in North Minneapolis. Simone Alexa is a Hawaii, Hawaii native, black indigenous people of color artist. Alexa is an emerging Twin Cities community artist and she's currently pursuing a BFA in drawing and painting with a minor in art history and engaged public arts at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Raised in a melting pot of diversity, Alexa has a unique perspective on representation that has inspired her to make work about empowering and healing black and brown bodies. Hawaiian and African-American culture has a focus on community and taking care of each other. In creating more representation, Alexa furthers the deconstruction of the already existing harmful representations of people of color. In her murals, Alexa's art has captured the power of people standing together. She, identi she uses identifiable images and symbols to com comfort viewers and inspire the continuous fight against injustice and inequality. Through multiple mediums, such as painting, drawing, digital illustration, and soft sculpture, Alexa reconstructs harmful representation for Hawaiian and African-American peoples. Other themes she deals with in her work include religion, the body, and identity through lenses of fantasy and Afrofuturism. We're very excited to have these two people joining us today. And we're gonna go ahead and start this off with um, our first question. So 
as we mentioned in the intro, um, with Minneapolis being a city very rich in resources for art spaces, it seems like the summer of 2020 pushed forward and centered conversations around the lack of support to BIPOC artists here. Um, and how and how to ensure uh, that BIPOC artists are continued to be given more opportunities. There have also been many discussions here on the importance of BIPOC artists, particularly Black artists, being the ones to create work, public work that memorializes victims of state sanctioned violence. We'd like to begin this discussion today by hearing your thoughts and experiences with navigating the art scene as a BIPOC artist in Minneapolis before the summer of 2020. What do you think has changed and in what ways do you think there's still work to be done? I'll go first with that one. Hey everybody, thank you for being here. Um, I have a hard time with this question only because I've I've been like a practicing artist for two years, but I guess I would think about it in terms of, I feel like I've really noticed in Minneapolis and I think this is still true to this day post or in the middle of the uprising and, and um, in this moment that it seems that black and brown folks are the ones that are creating the spaces that we wanna see and really the only thing I've seen change is um, white people mostly who are wanting to protect their property or image um, providing funds and space um, and that that is still something that is sporadic and um, inconsistent and um, I think the change isn't what the it doesn't match the facade <laughs> Um, the illusion of change really is what it is. Um, because even looking at this summer and what murals look like um, a year later, you can kind of see that support pulling back. And then thinking back to last summer being like, what, what even was the support? Like we were still kind of carving out the space that we wanted to see and having to advocate for, um, for ourselves to actually paint the images that reflect our experiences, so. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, thank you for having us again. Um, yeah, just, I guess to touch on with my, um, with like little bits that I also feel is like before the unrest, um, especially in like art institutions, like my college, like the Mia, the Walker, um, a lot of, um, a lot of questioning of the institution and questioning of uh, creating more opportunities and accessibility for people of color and just low income people in general. I feel like there was always the sort of like appeasement of like, oh, let me listen to you about stuff and maybe try and understand that it was never in a respectful way. It was always like if I had a piece of work that I was, um, you know, displaying that had to do with my experience, um, people felt like they could never try to connect with it and so they just wouldn't because that would mean that they would have to identify with their white privilege and work on themselves to deconstruct that before even working on like let me listen to what you have to say with your piece and so um it made it really hard to be uh, an artist that dealt with identity because a lot of these spaces weren't safe for my artwork and other artists like me and I think after the unrest I feel like a lot of the white gaze is sort of being forced to look at themselves and then be able to approach the art um, and also just respect that there's going to be places where they're not really welcome to look at art and know that there is stuff that's not for them which I think really disrupts the status quo and that might be one of the only things that I feel like has sort of changed in the positive I feel like everything else is like what Maya said where it's not really changing it's just kind of like they let us tire ourselves out and <laughs> now we're trying to find resources to continue fighting. Um, but yeah, one thing that I do feel like has changed is that people are understanding that if they see a mural that might have to do with like representation or is angry um, or, you know, all the ACAB stuff is they're like, okay, 
I just have to respect that. Like, that's not my place to, to go in and to put, put my opinion or to put my, um, to sort of uh, deal with, like, this is something I should be listening and should be quiet, not something that I need to be uh, sort of like figuring out and like getting my hands on. Thank you both. Um, such a great start, I think, to this panel. Both of your answers are incredible, and I feel like I could reflect on so many things. Um, but uh, Simone, your, your answer kind of is leading into our next question, which is, with the increase of support and resources for BIPOC artists creating work, memorializing victims of state violence, could you speak on your experiences of the emotional labor involved for BIPOC artists creating work so directly entangled with your lived experience? In what ways have you learned to care for yourself in creating emotionally heavy work during this movement? Uh, I think I'm still learning. I'm always trying to find new ways to practice self-care, but um, sort of on the flip side, as much as making art is exhausting, I do it because I feel like I have to. Like I couldn't sleep the night that I, you know, the night before I had watched that video of George Floyd being murdered, like I couldn't sleep, I was sick. And so like the next morning when everyone was coming out to help clean um, the streets, like I just felt like I had to do something. And it was the same thing for Dante Wright, like I just had to do something. And so in a way, that was healing for me. Um, as far as trying to just like keep going and keep going and keep going, I think that again, it's it's just being hopeful that people won't forget, people can't ignore the problems, as well as knowing that when I create work that empowers my brothers and sisters that like they feel like they can keep going. And so it's that that transfer of energy into a piece that people can take and heal. And so it's like by taking care of myself, I'm able to take care of other people. But um, it's never, I don't think it's ever going to be something that isn't going to be exhausting, or I'm ever going to be able to like, feel like I'm done with or, or that I can be healed, because it's something that leads into generational trauma, where I know that my children, and my nieces and nephews are still going to have to deal with this same thing. So I'm not exactly sure that there is any other moment where I can feel safe besides moments where, you know, like, you know, we hear that Chauvin is going to go to jail, unfortunately, not for as long as he should. But I know that when I was sitting on my couch, watching that video and like crying happy tears of joy with my family, like that was a moment that felt like a little bit of peace. Yeah, I echo a lot of what um, Simone was saying. Um, I think last summer, I mean, the response to everything was so rapid. And I think we were all kind of feeling the like need to act right now. And sometimes that was misguided, but we're all doing our best. And through that was able to build like this community and family of people that it really did feel so healing to be painting alongside people also thinking of like the intersection of pandemic uprising we were all so isolated really up until up until that point and how important it felt to be around other black and brown folks and um yeah thinking about not only painting messages of that reflect the nature of the uprising and I guess state sanctioned violence against black folks, but also that being an opportunity to provide images of people experiencing joy, messages of hope. Um, and I think that's something that I was able to also internalize and was really an important part because it's really hard to give yourself those reminders and allow yourself to feel hopeful and feel like it won't be like this forever when we haven't been shown that that's the case. Um, so I think I, I found a lot of healing through that. Um, also the nature of last summer, everything was extremely rapid. It was like hearing about a mural, you're whipping it out from design to execution in like three days to a week and painting like eight 
hour days in the hot, hot sun. Um, and I mean, I think that's also on coping is just like kind of doing things to the point where you're not um, fully tapped into what's happening and can't fully access the emotions tied to it because the weight of it is so incredibly heavy and having things working at a slower pace this year, I feel like that is part of the self-care is like letting the feelings come in as we have time saying no to projects that are just not it, whether it's organizations reaching out and they want um, images of joy and hope and community, but the figures should be a little bit more ambiguous, um, a little less queer, a little less black, um, and, and understanding that like we get to say no and that is also self-care, um, allowing yourself rest. Um, but yeah, I also echo what Simone was saying of like, I kind of don't have a choice of creating, like that is what, what feeds me. So in the same breath that it's this extremely healing thing, I am still a black person experiencing this trauma in real time. And um, even just thinking of some of the spaces that we've painted it and um, painting at Phelps Park is like a, a block away from my Nana's house where I grew up and Floyd Square is just a block away from my Nana's house where I grew up. So, I mean, there's days where it's like the most fueling thing ever. And then days when I get home and I sit down and I'm like, damn, that's a lot, <laughs> you know, like this is, it's a lot, it's a heavy load to carry. But I mean, it's also allows me to move through the trauma that I'm carrying and that I have to think about it intentionally and have the support of the people that I paint with to, to hold me through it. I appreciate both of your answers. Again, um, art can be so powerful, but I also appreciate both of you touching on both the emotional and physical labor that's involved in creating this art. Um, the physical conditions throughout last summer and this summer are something that you can't overlook. It's really hot, the working long hours, murals are outdoors. So I really appreciate um, both of you kind of speaking on that, especially during COVID. I mean, absolutely, like these are unprecedented times of isolation and um, speaking about the community is so important. So thank you. Um, many people outside of the Twin Cities have had the impression due to both lack of media coverage and incorrect media coverage that following the uprisings last summer, things have somewhat quieted down here with the recent murders of Dalal Id, Dante Wright, Winston Smith, and Deanna Marie how do you see art as an important tool for honoring lives lost and spreading awareness for what traditional media outlets, outlets suppress? Yeah, wow, what a great question. I mean, I think the question also kind of lightly touches on what I'm gonna say, but I mean, the reality is that the media does not touch on so much of what goes on and as black and brown people, we don't have the privilege of not being tapped into that. Um, that's our reality every day. And if, you know, we have to think about the fact that that could be us or a family member, a loved one, a friend, um, and you, you just have to be tapped into it. But I think something that I think a lot about is um, how important it is to have these their faces, the faces of those who have lost their lives to police violence out there where people have to pass it and look at it and say, I think we talked about this um, the last time I had a conversation with y'all, but people have to look at these images and be like, that was a human who doesn't get to move through their life. They don't get to do the things they wanna do, connect with their family members. And that's something that was taken away from them and they are no less human than anybody else. And I mean, as we know, like that is the narrative that allows for these murders to happen is that black and brown people are less than human to law enforcement. And that's a narrative that needs to be changed. Um, the painting that I did at Phelps Park um, on the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd I did a portrait of Makia Bryant and a lot of people 
I was surprised to hear a lot of people didn't know her story, didn't know who it was. I had a lot of people asking me if it was Brianna Taylor. Um, it acts as a catalyst for conversation for people to have to sit down and um, learn their stories, learn what happened to them and like think like in Makia Bryant's case, like this was a 16 year old girl and a baby and it should feel gut wrenching that like she doesn't get to experience all of the things out of life that she maybe didn't even know she wanted to do yet, you know? Um, she liked doing TikToks and doing her hair. And once you see that face, it's like, how can anybody say that 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 her fate was deserved, that what happened to her was justified? And I think that's true of of all of the folks that have lost their lives. Um, and then I also, in the in the same breath, think it's really important that we have the opportunity to honor folks while they're alive. And it is equally important and really heavy and hurtful that like we learn so many of these names after folks have passed. And um, I think we deserve the chance to be painting murals of people that are doing beautiful things or just existing um, in our communities right now in real time, so. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and I think too, um, elaborating more on like Maya's first point, just talking about like narratives. Um, I feel like as a person of color, like, like operating in a lot of like white spaces, it becomes almost like a second job to like my art activism of just like existing as like, a, not like, a storyteller but like almost like my own news outlet like in these environments like it's and it's like exhausting at the same time as it's something that I feel like just is part of my living experience is to like whenever I'm around people that are like hmm so tell me how do you feel about the unrest in Minneapolis or like you know I'll go out of state and people will be like oh yeah I hear I hear like Minneapolis is completely destroyed and it's like you know there's just rubble everywhere and to like have to like like every single day of my life, like be combating these, like just this propaganda, this brainwashing. And I think something, it's something that, you know, I want to just be like, okay, I'll tell you if you like give me 20 bucks, but also <laughs> something that I just will do, especially if it comes to like, you know, my boyfriend's family or like just people that feel comfortable talking to me. Like I feel, I feel like it's almost a superpower that if people see me and they think that I am a, safe person of color or like you know like a nice black girl that like I can easily disrupt them that narrative by being like no I'm angry and I'm ready to like you know kind of shake your world a little bit um and I hope that my artwork acts as almost an extension of that where I can re like take back these narratives and hopefully people seeing this art in public spaces will encourage them to like do their own research instead of maybe going to another person of color and stressing them out by being like, you need to explain to me what's happening because that's not our job if we don't want it to be our job. And I think as art activists, we kind of take that on as if we're like ambassadors in some cases. Um, and it's very an extension of the work that is honestly probably the most exhausting part of it. Like I have more fun just empowering people of color, but when it comes to like explaining just the brainwashing that happens in our country, like that's where I think stuff really hurts. And again, you get that gut wrenching feeling that this is something real that's happening that people don't know about. And it just, it kind of like blows my mind that it's only like one video that got viral when there's so so many videos that you know so so many stories like you know uh, we'll be painting a wall and putting down names and just hear like people being like oh can you put my cousin's name can you put like my sister's name or like my friend's name from high school and it, it'll be like someone that's like in their 60s and this happens when they were in high school like you know decades and decades ago and it's it's just it's so much more than what people will be told. And so doing that work is important. <laughs>
Absolutely, yes. Um, and thank you also for saying out loud that there's a certain hazard that comes with being perceived as a safe Black person that pe people can just bring whatever questions they want to you whenever they want without checking in first if you even have the capacity to deal with it if that's even what your relationship with them is i think people really have revealed over the past year more than ever um an ignorance of boundaries and have disrespected those boundaries perpetually um so yeah that all resonated with me very heavily so thank you for being willing to say that out loud as you did um, and I think this is a good opportunity to move into the next question, which is in what ways, if any, have the uprisings of the last year affected your relationship to your art? So that could be your process, your production, your style, your medium, and how, if you do, of course, how do you work to differentiate your personal pieces from the work that you're doing for the community? Is there a distinction there for you? That's a really interesting question. I think being in a, an art school and like having a lot of artists around me has helped me become more aware of how my art has changed because I know a lot of my classmates haven't been able to make art over COVID. They've just been so exhausted. And then I think because my artwork is so like intertangled with like my politics and my moral life that like I felt like I had to make art not so much for me, but for me. And that was the reason why I felt like I had the motivation to go out. So I, I haven't even like thought about my personal practice. <laughs> Everything has just been very focused on like, what do people need from me as a person versus what do you, I want to make? Um, and of course, the art that I am making is stuff that I want to make, but um, it's just become so much more of, I feel like, a service that I feel like I can provide versus what I feel like I love to do. In, in a way that, that it's, it, I feel like my normal art is I'll spend you know, months and months and months making oil painting. And it'll make me very, very happy. But when I'm out, Muraling. What keeps me going is the people that come by, you know, every like 10 to 15 minutes that I say, Thank you. Simone, um, I think you're cutting out a little bit. I love, I love this. Simone, can you hear me? Oh, I think we might have lost them. Um, I'm not sure if you would like to speak, Maya, while we work to get Simone back. Yeah, totally. I, um, hmm. I have been definitely battling with the feeling. I mean, I have wanted to do public art for such a long time and murals and it's always felt like this kind of unattainable thing. Um, and having that opportunity and seeing what, um, having images that are accessible to communities and to everybody and seeing how powerful that is. and um, yeah, what that what that can do for starting conversation, for providing hope and joy for the communities that the images belong to, it's this kind of different power and fuel that I 
not that I don't get from my personal practice, but feels different. And it has been this kind of battle of allowing myself to understand that like me having my personal practice as well as my public art practice isn't a selfish thing. Um, a lot of what I explore in my personal practice is um, different facets of my own identity. And that's often done through self portraiture. Since doing the mural work and, um, and the uprising and last summer and all of the continued um, heaviness since then, I have shifted to looking at more kind of like familial ties and family portraits and um, thinking about, yeah, those that came before me and, and using that as a way to stay connected and thinking about that in the way that that's something that we do with our public art is it's a way for us to stay connected with each other, stay connected with our communities. And yeah, something about painting family members who has passed has kind of given me the same sense of joy and connection that I, I get from my mural practice. And I think something that's super exciting is in my personal practice, I do a lot of mixed media working with like a lot of texture, um, textiles, paper, um, braiding hair. And that's something that I've been wanting to explore more with murals. And um, I think it's really exciting that like it gets to be whatever we want it to be. And it doesn't just have to be paint on a wall. And um, I've got to play around with that a few different times in a few different ways based on um, the wall site. If it's on plywood um, and that's something that I want to continue to I want to challenge the way we look at murals and why can't we merge sculpture with mural or make it a an even deeper um, experience something that's kind of multi-sensory and um, and more interactive and I think that also is like an added drawing people in and like forcing them to engage with the work and take a moment look at it um, what is the piece saying and and how does that how does that impact you and what is your role in the message that's being shared so absolutely I think interpretation is huge and that actually you guys are so great like every answer that you're giving is just like perfectly leading into what I want us to talk about and so thank you for being of one mind with me right now um, I'm really interested in how your relationship to your art after you've created it um, shifts. Um, and I guess bear with me as I explain and let me know if I can clarify. But um, I think traditionally, aura is kind of defined, like the aura of a piece of art would be its authenticity, um, the site specificity of where it was made and the originality of that. But, um, as we know that there's people who are documenting this work and there's people who are physically collecting this work, perhaps sometimes without artist permission, there's kind of a severing that occurs at different stages to that initial aura. Um, so what does that mean for you and your art? How does it feel to have it collected, documented, um, do you feel ownership of the pieces? Do you feel that the narrative shifts when you're not able to control it yourself? To what extent does individual interpretation play a role? Because I, of course, you know that if you're making art that's gonna be seen by the public, people will look at it however they want to. So how does that kind of ebb and flow for you? So that's, I love this question because it's something that I've had to, I feel like reconcile with a lot as an artist in the last year. And I think starting muraling as like something that's gonna go on these plywood boards it and something that is so ephemeral and the, the idea of ownership being like so fluid with them, especially if you're collaborating with other artists and you know, like depending on like payment and if you're just doing it for like the, the business that the boards are on. Um, I had to build a relationship with this piece that was very spiritual to me where I thought that I was putting so much of my energy into this piece and hopefully 
everyone that it was for, everyone in the community that walked by could take that and their joy and their empowerment from the piece um, and feeling like their voices are heard and feeling like there's other people that are mad with them. And by the time the piece was taken down or thrown away or wherever it ended up going, that it served as the conduit and nothing more. And that it, it did its purpose. So it's not needed anymore. It's like, you know, like, you know, a tree going to sleep and the leaves falling, becoming nutrients for the earth for the next spring. Like that's how I felt about those pieces. But um, I think having that mindset is really important because I had a piece recently that I had put in a community space for people to look at that uh, unfortunately got stolen. And I spent so much time, like I built the canvas myself, I stretched it, um, like I painted it during COVID. So it was like one of my only like projects. And, you know, I'd spent like maybe like somewhere between 40 to 60 hours on this painting and to just have it like disappear. Like I, I cry, like it hurt because it was, it almost felt like a, like a maternal, Thing, like an extension of myself and you know I can only just hope that whoever has it now it's doing its purpose for them in that space and like you know they're taking care of it as much as um, I would but it's one of those things where it's like I I'm very like spiritual and like I just have to have faith that things will be happening the right way that they can be in a lot of my artwork, I try to equip my, um, my, the people in the piece with, um, like, you know, tigers or weapons, something that I feel like if there is someone that's looking at them with a voyeuristic gaze or a gaze that is, um, maybe scrutinizing or, you know, comes from a mindset that is trying to take my pieces like a commodity, I always feel like if I'm not there, but if my characters have, like, you know, a, a tiger or, you know, some, some sort of like animal that's there protecting them, that, that will, that will make the viewer worried that, you know, they, they can't just gaze upon my piece, but there is someone there that it's going to be like, I'm watching you. <laughs> I love that so much, Simone. <laughs> oh yeah. Greeting. It's also, that's, so special because it's like allows the the figures to yeah have an energy of their own and kind of like an autonomy of their own and I love that um oh yeah what a what a question I I think in my personal practice I so am able to acknowledge the impermanent nature of everything like I do a lot of like heavy textural mixed media stuff because I want people to want to touch it and engage with it in that way. And I think art is often like so untouchable and like kind of held up almost as like a, like a godly entity where it's like observe from afar, don't get too close, don't engage with it. And the, I mean, the reality is nothing lasts forever. And if, if something falls off, then it falls off. Um, but I think just knowing the the conditions under which these images were created and um I mean the energy that we were experiencing and holding while creating them and that goes directly into the piece and that lives in the piece it's like extra extra sensitive and I wish that I could harness some <laughs> Simone's energy um because I don't know if I'm allowed to swear but we've dealt with some bullshit <laughs> like it's been um, a year and a half of like a lot of bullshit and disrespect and um, people not valuing the work that we do and not recognizing, um, yeah, the fact that we are people of color experiencing the trauma in real time. And in addition to giving just the regular like energy and vulnerability of sharing an image that artists do, it's like there's this added layer of, um, yeah, I mean, it is it is a labor to be telling people what we're going through. And it's actually a huge privilege for people to be able to experience that without, it's like people aren't walking by and like paying like, oh, thank you for telling me what it's like to be a black person from your voice and not from my interpretation of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's been some instances where buildings have better whoever paid us for the murals have been extremely disrespectful in the way that the work is handled 
or giving the work back to us when that was the agreement or whatever it might be. Simone and I did a mural, um, this kind of mural project where we each had our own board and they stapled canvas to the board and I had a bunch of mixed media elements that were stapled to it. And without our knowledge, they removed the canvases and we never heard again what happened with them. <laughs> so it's like things like that. It is, it is hard because for me, it's not a matter of me feeling like I have ownership over the image. If I created that image in um, a specific neighborhood, a lot of the stuff is also site specific and that belongs to the community. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to whoever decided it should go wherever. And I think it should be up to the community. And also like we deserve to see all the beautiful art that was created and is still being created like every day on every street. It's not like there's a shortage of um, businesses or buildings where, where things could live. And, you know, alongside that is the fact that if, I think it should be up to artists and the community um, because we do all deserve to experience um, the beautiful art that's been created. And also if an artist feels really attached to it and it was created under these really intense circumstances, then they should get to decide what happens. Um, and also in acknowledging that, I want to acknowledge that this is the first time anything like this has happened where we were all creating or painting on these boards and like just rapid fire. And I mean, nobody was thinking about what's gonna happen to them next. And it's the first time that boards are being collected to be preserved and, and whatever. So I, I wanna acknowledge that like we're all learning in real time. And I just um, think that a lot more conversation can and will happen going forward where everybody's needs can be met. Absolutely. Um, I'm definitely familiar with some of the scenarios that you all are referring to. And I'm so sorry that those things have happened. I think um, I work in an art institution, a very large one that tends to not be very good with the community. And so I was very hopeful with all of the opportunity that kind of manifested over the past year for people to do things well and to do them right, um, that things could be better. So I'm sorry that that hasn't always been the case, but it's also a relief to hear that despite how jaded you may be, that there is still some hope in that. Um, it's very funny too. I Someone had said that I've never seen so many activists in Minneapolis until all of a sudden this past year, like people I never even knew lived here or like were about that are all of a sudden inserting themselves. Um, and so I think intentionality has a lot to do with that too. And people understanding the communities that they're inserting themselves in, particularly if they're not from that community. As you said, you, that's your grandma's neighborhood. That's like, that's your home in, to a certain extent. Um, and so again, what you said really resonated with me. I'm just gonna have to buy everyone coffee outside of this and we'll just talk more because this has all been very, very, whew, like I'm getting hot, I'm getting worked up about it. But so thank you all for that. And I'd like to take us back to a place of some joy though because I know that that's all been a very frustrating process, I'm sure. And I'd really love to know, um, I know that maybe you can't each share your screens right now, like this is kind of impromptu, of course, but if you could maybe talk us through a piece that you felt was really healing to make for you. Um, if you were able to show us, great, but also I know that, like I said, this is kind of on the spot for you. So a verbal description is just as good. I'm gonna try to pull something up. So just give me one second here. Um, sure. Everything is like, I'm like objectively bad at taking photos of things, <laughs> um, which is really unfortunate uh, when it comes to documenting your work, but I'll do my best. I just wanted to say real quick while Maya is looking up that photo that um, we may not get to um, questions just because this is such a powerful conversation and we want to make sure that we're keeping this going. So if we don't get to questions, I apologize, but I feel like this is 
you know, the way that this uh, panel was kind of meant to, the direction it was meant to take. So just wanted to put that out there. I think I have my piece. Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Simone. Okay. Um, so the piece that I want to share is actually the piece that um, Maya was just talking about, the one that we did um, in North Minneapolis um, in like sort of like this parking lot for the um, 30 days of prayer. And um, so can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, so. Beautiful. Um, so this one I entitled uh, Warrior Mother. And uh, so the event was, there was artists, there were, um, you know, community leaders like leading, um, you know, prayers. And it was meant to be an event that was, would promote healing, create a space for grief and, um, and also like a place for hope and looking at the future. And so this piece um, is to commemorate um, all of our, you know, warrior mothers in our community because I know that um, women and femme presenting uh, humans are just so strong, like, and I feel like undervalued in so many ways in our society, but in our community, the, the matriarchs do so much besides, you know, just giving birth to us, but also like protecting us and creating safe places at home. And um, at the end of the day, I feel like they're some of the ones that grieve and suffer so much from like the loss of of us, <laughs> whether that's, you know, through murder or um, through just the disparagement and margin marginalization that we suffer from. Um, and so in this piece specifically, um, I have this, you know, this mother warrior figure um, that's, you know, in very regal attire um, at night, um, who's holding this little baby. Um, and is you know protecting the baby, protecting the water, um, and is like defending that, but in the most nurturing way, as in to say like you know like don't fuck with me, <laughs> like um, and also like this metaphor of like passing on the sword to like next generations, whoever whoever that may be. And on the right, um, I have this skeleton of this boar figure that's you know supposed to symbolize this huge monster that we're up against, as well as. Um, this is a symbolism of like poor as pigs, um, pigs meaning the police, um, because I feel like a lot of times when discussing about like, you know, all cops are bastards or just, you know, saying like defund the police, the first argument that I always hear back is like, oh, not every cop is bad. And it's, and it's like, okay, but you don't get the point. The point is that it's a broken, corrupt system. And so I feel like using the symbolism of a system like a big monster that needs to be destroyed is a lot more powerful and understanding to the point versus you know like one cop in a uniform um and yeah and so that's kind of what this piece is about if anyone wants me to zoom in just yeah um i'll just like maybe go over the whole image i don't know if my zooming in helps oh it's it's yeah it's working really well and it's just a beautiful piece simone thank you for sharing thank this. you yeah it's like a, yeah, it's I think Eight feet by six feet. Wow. Yeah, amazing. I haven't seen this one yet either. So this is, again, like I have chills, like I'm so excited. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. So <laughs> looking at that, I never saw it when it was finished um, because I think our last day of paint, I wasn't there for um, your last day of painting. So, wow, what an incredibly powerful piece. And I hope they just have it living in like the most beautiful, like that needs like a gold decaled frame. Um, that, yeah, that is so incredibly powerful. And I also would just like to say, I don't know how you did that with acrylic paint. <laughs> and with the like colors and brushes we were working with, that's a true feat, y'all. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I have two different pieces that I'll just touch on both quickly um, because they are very different. Um, and I also am confused as to how to do this. So we'll see how it goes. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Um, okay. 
everybody can see what I've got going. Yeah. Um, so this was uh, this was my third mural. Technically, my first mural the, were the two that I did at Seward Co-op. Um, and one of those was honoring Tony McDade and Black trans lives. And the other was about the passing of the torch, if you will, um, like our ancestors got us to where we're at and just the strength of youth voices. And um, this piece here was really a lot of fun to pull together. Again, it was one of those things where I think I heard about it two days before. So, um, you know, coordinating with the folks I was painting with on design via text. And um, it was a really fun process to design something that wasn't figurative. Um, and just kind of thinking of like the power of a statement. Um, and this was also the first time I got to play around with um, putting the flowers on the mural. And this was one of the stories of, um, at no point did the building have ownership over the boards. Um, we were paid by Lake Street City Council. And then it's like when they were, when they took them down, they were like, we're gonna hold on to them for the period of time that the trial will be happening in Minneapolis. And it was like, okay, yeah, great. It's gonna be beautiful to see those up and up and available again. And then they just never put them up. And then, you know, it was a whole back and forth and finding out that um, the messaging of these boards wasn't in alignment with their values per what they told us. So a feeling really like warmed and relieved to have these back in our possession after like a, a huge battle and just trying to figure out where they can um, live after this. But I think I really enjoyed this process as well because this was kind of tucked away. So we didn't have as many people walking by and coming up and asking questions, which is also for some people that's like a part of the process that they enjoy. And for me, I'm like, absolutely don't have the energy unless it is a black person or brown person coming up to have a conversation. And usually that conversation goes different than somebody kind of demanding to hear ab about how I'm doing and what I'm going through. And it's like, we all know how <laughs> doing. Um, so yeah, this one definitely lives in my heart. And then one more. Um, and then jumping back to like more figurative stuff, this was a really exciting one to work on. I got to do it with my cousin who's indigenous and it was the two of us working on it. And it's um, a church in St. Paul. And I think they had like six or eight of these that were painted just directly on the building. So it was Creatives After Curfew Artists and then um, City Mischief, which is another um, BIPOC collective of artists. Um, Simone has painted with them. We've done a lot of collaborative stuff and um, yeah, just the power of like painting alongside so many beautiful humans. And this is really reflective of the nature of City Mischief, which is a lot of indigenous artists and um, Creatives After Curfew, which is a lot of black and other people of color. Um, and the ways in which our struggles are so interconnected. And when you talk about fighting for black lives, that inherently means we're fighting for our indigenous brothers and sisters. And um, when we're talking about protecting black trans women, we're also talking about acknowledging and fighting for the safety of the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and yeah, those, I mean, we're, we're stronger together, I think is absolutely the truth. Absolutely. Um... Again, you all are just saying all the things that are always in my mind. So I'm so thrilled because, of course, Black liberation and Indigenous liberation and sovereignty are inherently intertwined and you can't have one movement without the other. And the sooner the rest of the world understands that, the sooner that we can get closer to being free. So thank you both. Honestly, this has been, I have goosebumps and it's not because of the air conditioning. It's entirely from you all. So thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to connect with you all outside of this. Sorry, everyone who's watching, who doesn't get to, but absolutely just dazzling, both of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank yes, you so thank much you. for holding down this space. It's, I always leave these conversations just like so energized and I would absolutely love to 
to get connected um, outside of the space, build those real relationships, continue the conversations. Yes, please. And I love coffee. So if coffee's involved, I am there. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you both so much for your time today. I know it's a holiday weekend, but it really just, it means so much that we were able to have this conversation. Um, Rachel and Amber, do you have anything to say before we log out? I echo everything that Freddie said. I'm, I'm so excited to work with you both in the future and I had so much goosebumps as well. Felt like I was a little bit close to tears at some parts. So um, I just appreciate you both so much. And thank you uh, Labor Fest for hosting um, this panel um, and uh, Heather and Todd. So thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone.